I'll be reading our scripture lesson today, which is, uh, comes from De- Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20, which is also printed in your bulletin. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of God for the people of God. I want to take just a moment before the message and uh, to encourage you just another step further. Uh, With our mission celebration this weekend, uh, I am reminded again and again just how blessed that we are. At First Broad Street, there aren't many United Methodist congregations that have mission celebrations on a regular basis. We are blessed with the resources to be able to do that. And if you haven't been in a few years or if you've never been, I hope that you'll make a point, first of all, of of praying for this year's mission celebration. Margaret bid us to be praying for those who are going to be traveling and uh, most are traveling and some a good distance uh, to be with us. So be praying for them and be praying for what God does during the course of this weekend. So not only uh, are we fortunate to be able to to pull this off each year, but um, this is also an opportunity uh, for us to connect those names and faces with the places and the people that we support. But it opens a door It opens a door for God to uh, have space to do something new in each of our lives. I was reminded last night at uh, John's Island dinner of something that Danny Howe, our missions director, said. And, And he talked about how less than two years ago, we did not have a relationship uh, with, um, with our elementary school here in, in this area. And, um, so, someone caught a vision for that and and that vision was communicated to others and it has grown all because someone had a vision and this Friday night the children from the school are going to come and they're going to sing during our Friday night worship time and I want to invite you to come and to be a part of that We're also just really blessed by our speakers this year, not only the workshop leaders, but our our keynote speakers. Bishop Paul Leland was here three years ago uh, for the Poverty Forum, and he just endeared himself to so many of us uh, by his uh, his very winsome way, the way he moved about our building and just building relationships in the short time that he was here. I uh, I think you'll be touched by his sharing. Uh, Jerry Russell has served as a missionary in Central America for a number of years, but for the last 20 plus years, he's been the senior pastor at uh, Fairview United Methodist Church in the Maryville uh, area, where uh, that church has grown from an average of 400 in worship to around 1,100 in worship. And so uh, he brings something to the table as he comes to be with us as well. So I hope that you will choose to be at the table. It's a good place for us to build community across our five different worship services so that you can see one another and so that you can eat with one another and, and worship with each other. You heard the scripture reading this morning. I've read this passage over and over and over again. And each time I've read it, I've found that there are some words that just kind of disappear onto the page and disappear out of my mind. 
But there's one single word that every time I read it, that word just leaps from the page. It pops, if you will. It's one that, uh, that I'll probably just circle eventually on, in this Bible that I'm using. And, and, and the word is choose. Choose. You were asked during our greeting time this morning uh, to, um, to share with someone else what the most life-changing choice is that you've ever made. And so I was standing in the back with the choir and I was listening. I was listening, I was paying attention. And so the thing that I heard come out most often was the most life-changing choice I've ever made was to get married. Someone else said, no, the most life-changing choice I ever made was to stay married. <laughs> and that can work different ways for us, can't it? When I was a district superintendent, a pastor came to, to serve in the Marstown district who was from Zimbabwe. He had studied theology at Africa University, and he had come to the United States to, uh, to work on his PhD, and his hope is to return to um, Zimbabwe and to return to Africa University and to teach there. Nearly a year after his arrival, his wife and his children were still not with him, and, and we knew that we needed to get this family together. So we made arrangements to, to get his wife and his boys over here. I recall asking him how his wife was adjusting after they had been here for about a month, and so uh, he volunteered that the boys were, were doing pretty good. The boys were doing better than, than his wife was doing. The adjustment had not been an easy one for his spouse. And I asked Sam, I said, what's been her greatest surprise since she's been here? That was my question. What is it that has surprised her most since she has been here? And her answer was very simple. Her answer to what has surprised her most was this. Walmart. Walmart. And then he added this line, too many choices. And when you come from a culture where you walk into a store and there's a limited number of items on a shelf, maybe only one of that kind, you don't have choices. But the biggest surprise for her was choices and Walmart. On the, uh, on the one hand, we, uh, we like having choices. And for the most part, we uh, take for granted the many choices that we do have here in America. A year ago at this time, I had just returned from Ye, South Sudan. I had told myself that I, what, I wouldn't be that shocked by what I saw and by what I experienced there. But that was incredibly naive on my part. And I confess that. But you know, one of the things that I found that I missed most in the days that I was there was um, choices. I missed the choices that make my life comfortable. As I recall, there was only one public restaurant in Yate. At least there was only one that they were willing to take us to, okay? Um, I believe I only saw one pharmacy and I know that I only saw one place to purchase Petro, to buy gasoline. Contrast that with, uh, with the United States. We're a nation of, of choosers, paper or plastic, small, medium, large, or would you like me to supersize that fry for you? Fries or chips, organic or conventional. Having choices has become an expectation of American life. I mean, what would we do now? What would you do now without choices? The book of Deuteronomy is considered to be Moses' farewell address. It's the last thing that he's credited with writing. It is uh, sometimes referred to as his closing sermon to the people of Israel prior to his death. So there's all kinds of things that he wants them to know before he dies and before their entry into the promised land. If you haven't ever looked at uh, 
uh, Deuteronomy. I, I bid you to take a, take a look at it. It's not that hard to read. But it goes on and on and on and on for 34 chapters. And you think I have long-winded days, okay? Moses here tells the people that they've got two choices. Either life and prosperity or or they can choose death and adversity. And the choice rests with them. On the one hand, if, if the people make the correct choice, then Israel have, will have a long future. If they don't make that choice, then Israel's days are numbered. For Israel, life and prosperity meant that human activity would be under the protection of God if they chose God, if they chose life. They would live securely on the land, their land would be fertile, they would be prosperous, but also they as a people would multiply, they would have children, they would have descendants that would fill this new land. On the other hand, death would mean that God would be absent in their human activity. And the people would be forced to exist outside of the land. They wouldn't have security. They wouldn't have peace. And so that means at this moment, as Moses is delivering this address, as he's delivering the sermon, they're standing at a crossroads. Now part of um, their choosing means that they choose to be obedient to God and to God's ways. And there's that word, isn't it? That word, obedience. And even though it's not specifically used, it's implied there. The choice that is offered in Deuteronomy is one that, well, it just doesn't sit well in the 21st century. It doesn't sit well with us because we're accustomed to many choices. And come to think of it, Deuteronomy does not doesn't really offer a choice as much as it requires that a particular choice be made. It says, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. But if your hearts turn away, then you shall perish. And have you ever noticed, even most church people don't like these kinds of of pronouncements that we find here today. We don't like it when, when God sounds so autocratic or in conflict with the free grace that we've come to expect in Jesus Christ. And maybe it's not so much the word that's printed on the page that we find ourselves coming into conflict with. Maybe what we come into conflict with are the messengers. The ones that we've heard through the years who, who seem to handle that word recklessly and who apply a, bl- a brand of, of theology that makes God's work and love and grace conditional, whether it's hurricanes or whether it's AIDS. And so when we feel the hair on the back of our neck begin to stand up, we simply shut down. We just shut down to the Word and begin to steer clear of its message altogether. Did you hear it? Did you hear the words from the page? The choice and its consequences are clear. Choose covenant and receive life. Reject covenant, choose death. Choose covenant and gain land. Reject covenant and lose the land. Choose covenant and receive blessing. Reject covenant and receive a curse. And for a people that are accustomed to wider selections, it doesn't sit well with us. So we resist any effort to have our choices curtailed. We resist because it's threatening to us. We resist because it threatens our illusion of our autonomy. And autonomy has become a central value in our culture. We simply don't want to imagine God as demanding obedience that must be chosen if we're to have a future. So where does that leave us then? What's our choice? 
What is our choice? Well, the thing is, we know what we want to do. We know that we want to figure it out ourselves. We want, know that we want to be left alone and that somewhere inside of us there, there is that knowledge that's just going to come forth and we're going, to, we're going to make our decisions based on that. And if things don't work out to suit us, well, well of course, we'll just blame someone else. And if, and if it doesn't set well to, to blame the other, then we'll blame God for not rescuing us for the choices that we've made. Deuteronomyism is clear. Deuteronomy is clear in that there will be, if you'll excuse me, hell to pay. There'll be hell to pay for the choices that we make when those choices run counter to God's covenantal relationships. Now you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I believe all that. In fact, I'll just say it, Pastor, I don't believe it. Okay, think about it. Think about the relationships that you have. Think about those most important choices that you have made that have changed your life that involve relationships. Promises that are violated in marriage usually end in divorce. Destructive secrets that find their way out into the open from the places where families hide them or well, the pain, it just destroys the fabric of the family. Irresponsible financial choices run their course, and it sets families into a downward spiral. Some folks never recover, and some it takes years to recover. You see, there are severe consequences when we violate our relationship covenants. And it's not just about the covenants that we have with those in our home or, or, or in our immediate spheres of, uh, of relationships. It happens in, in churches too. In churches, conflicts arise. Words are exchanged. Sides are taken. Splits occur. And it takes years for some congregations to leave the pain and to leave the isolation behind. And the reality is some churches never leave it. They never move on. They're never able to work through it. Pastors come and go. Staff turn over. They come and go. But the unresolved pain still remains. And it's true in the wider world as well. We're just beginning to recover from the results of U.S. and world markets crashing in 2008 and 2009. You know, all that happened because covenant was broken. We wanted more than prudent choices should have allowed. And what it demonstrated to us is that God's ethical demands for fairness exist even in the marketplace. And when it's violated, in the name of greed, it crumbles. You know that we would like to believe that um, God doesn't care about such things as this. We'd like to believe that God doesn't care about the choices that we make. But if we accept that, that would mean that we've been led further astray than we first imagined. It would mean that we've bowed down to the gods of choice. That's what Moses is talking about here that the people are going to face. They're going to face gods of choice. And we've bowed down to them more often than we are willing to admit. And yes, I know, I know just as well as you do, that misfortune is not necessarily connected to God's judgment. Just as every material blessing is not necessarily a sign of human faithfulness. I know just as you know, that bad things do happen to good people, and that good things sometimes happen to bad people. And in case you're wondering, in case you're scratching your head figuratively, and wondering, what, what does this have to do with the title of the message today, The Forgiving Spirit of God? Ah, I'm glad you asked that question. So here it is. 
When the choice between life and death that Moses describes here is presented, that means that for some of us, we're going to recognize that we have been on a path that is leading to no good end. In fact, the path that we've been on may have already led to destruction. It may have already led to the destruction of bodily health or mental and emotional health. It may have led to the destruction of relationships. It may have led to the destruction of our relationship with God. So the choice is, will we continue in that direction or will we turn toward life? And that turning for us as Judeo-Christian people is called repentance. To t repent is to turn. And turning or repentance is hard. It's hard and it is painful. It's hard because we've gotten accustomed to making those wrong choices. It's hard because if we leave those, cho those choices, it means that we're not sure what's going to happen in that new land and in that new place. It's hard to turn. It's hard to repent when we've been living with the shame and the guilt, carrying it for so long that we don't know what it would even feel like to walk upright. But here in this place, here in this place, we hear the good news. And the good news is that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And those are the words that we hear every time we prepare to come to this table. When we offer a prayer of confession that may have words like, forgive us for those things that we have done that we ought not to have done and the things that we have left undone that we ought to have done. We believe that there is forgiveness from God for any shame or guilt that we may carry when we seek to live faithfully with God and with others. It is central to the sacramental act that we celebrate here time and time again. There's a paraphrase of these words today that I would offer to you. The paraphrase goes something like this. Listen to what I have said today. I've laid it out for you. Life and death, good and evil. Love God. Walk in God's ways. Keep the commandments so that you will live, truly live, passionately, joyfully blessed by God. I warn you, if you have a change of heart, if you refuse to listen and serve little gods, you'll die. It's your choice, life or death, blessings or cursings. The choices that we are faced with daily are not usually labeled life and death choices. For the most part, we don't think in those terms. Most of our decisions, in fact, seem rather unimportant. But life and death are before us every day. We choose death when we ignore God. We choose death when we choose anything that is inferior to God. And death, well, it can be a slow process. It can be a slow process of you and I giving ourselves time and time again to what doesn't matter. And when that happens, the spirit just dies. So having heard the words of Moses today, or as they're offered as words of Moses, what will you give yourself to? What will you give yourself to? If you're going to choose life, what does that look like? I make these suggestions to you. The first is to give yourself to worship. To worship God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. 
to worship God with your mind and with your strength, and to pray genuinely. Margaret Deans is often reminding us about our living into, growing into um, who God has created us to be. And as she does that, she is reminding us of what it means to live fully and to live faithfully as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus Christ. So love God and worship God. And with that, love your church. Every chance you get, speak blessing over your church, both here in these walls and outside of these walls. Never hesitate to say a positive word about what God is doing in the congregation that you choose to live out your discipleship through. Believe that God loves you. And all those stories that you might have heard or learned as a child about Jesus, remember them. Let them come back to mind and remember the lesson that was at the core of each one of them. See Christ in the people that are around you. Share God's love with someone who has forgotten that God loves them or maybe that had never heard it. Treat others fairly. Delight in God's gifts. Give to the poor. Care for the hurting. Share food with the hungry. And be patient with your own imperfections as well as the imperfections of others. Apologize to someone even if it was his fault. Forgive someone even if you think she does not deserve it. Have patience. Have patience in all of these things so that all of life can be seen and experienced as holy. This is what it means to choose life in the 21st century. Open your heart to the Spirit of God and let God be God. And along this journey, Know God's forgiving spirit in your life so that you don't get stuck, so that you don't get used to some of the choices that drag you down because they don't give life. They only lead to death. Choose life, for that's what God has given you in your birth, that's what God has been bringing you in to a fullness of as a youth, as an adult. And that's what God has promised for you, eternal life. And who would ever want to miss out on that? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it um, has found its way on the page to us as 21st century Americans who are so accustomed to many choices. Help us to hear the choices that you set before us. Help us to hear them not as withholding, but as life-giving. Help us not to hear them as those things that might restrict us, but rather those things that grant us freedom, real freedom and real life. Pour out your spirit upon us, O oh God. Let your spirit move among us here this day. For the one who is struggling with decisions of the past that have led only to negative consequences. Speak your word of love and forgiveness into their hearing this day and grant them the courage to let go, to let go of those things that bind them. To the one, O oh God, who feels their bondage but also feels the tug of your Holy Spirit Grant them the wisdom to know the difference 
and know the source of true life. To the one who is coming to faith, who is seeking you, O God, may your spirit speak its word into their hearing today so that they would leave here having made the choice to accept your love and to follow Jesus. Hear the prayers of your people. In your name we pray. Amen.